uh, slideshow? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me just start off a little bit about who I am. I'm November 6th, Charlie Victor Oscar. Uh, I came in to ham radio as a no-code technician. I was interested in it for years and years. Uh, before that, I uh, just never really put the effort into getting through the code. So um, I was really driven by a trip we had to the South Pacific. We took a adventure down there for a couple of years and got my general before that and uh, we sailed around the South Pacific. So that's what really got me into ham radio and uh, using it on a daily basis. Uh, as far as ballooning goes and stuff, I've been interested in it for a few years. It's been, I guess now almost two years or a year and a half since uh, we launched our first balloon and uh, we've been uh, tracking those and stuff. And then uh, currently I'm a hydroelectric power plant technician. So I keep a couple of our power plants out here in the West Coast running. Uh, and in addition to that, I'm also, uh, I do a little bit of ham radio stuff. I'm uh, the assistant DEC for the High Desert District of Aries, uh, amongst other stuff. <laughs> so like most of you that have volunteer, you kind of understand how those things go. You start off with one small thing and it just kind of uh, builds on that. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about what we're here for tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about Pico balloons and what they are. So basically what we have is we have what's a flight package, which is a small balloon, generally about three foot in diameter. Uh, it's like the ones you could find in your party stores or at, uh, yeah, you know, Walmart or something like that. And then hanging below it, it have a dipole and a little tracker of some sort, a couple little solar panels on it. And then at the other end of the dipole, a uh, little bit of a weight to keep everything straight. The whole flight package is a, a small unit and I'll give you some details about that. Um, let me go ahead and say that if you do have questions and you want to, uh, something's a burning desire, go ahead and ask it. If you have other stuff you want to ask about at the end of the presentation, I love having a Q&A afterwards. Uh, that's great, I learn a lot and that's kind of how this presentation's been built. So let's get into it. So what is a, a Pico balloon? Well, it's a balloon that has a flight duration, you know, in days or weeks. So not like your, you might have heard about high altitude ballooning or HABs. Um, those are balloons like a lot of schools launch. They'll go up to near 100,000 feet. The balloons burst, they come down, usually use amateur radio for tracking the payload and then fox hunting it down to find it and recover it. And they'll take pictures of the earth and stuff in real high altitude. This is kind of the, whoops opposite of that. Um, these are really small payloads, sending you know just a small amount of data down and we're trying to get them to stay up and uh, float around the globe. Um, with that said, they can circumnavigate the earth. So they can go all the way around the earth if you get it set up right. The payloads only weigh 12 to 17 grams. So that's less than half an ounce. Um, the balloons themselves are called, uh, what's called super pressure configuration. So what that means, it's not like a hot air balloon where one end's open, uh, it's sealed. And generally they, for the most part, they don't stretch. Um, not like a rubber balloon or latex balloon. So that means that once they're filled up, they maintain the same volume. As they go higher up in the air, the pressure inside may increase, but the volume stays the same. And that's really important because that's what gets you your neutral buoyancy and gets the balloon to float along. You know, it stops its ascent and floats along. The balancing act there is trying to get a balloon to float as high as you can without the pressure inside getting so high that it bursts the balloon. And uh, you know that's one of the real challenges that we have. And again, like I said, it's a free floating balloon. It's not tethered. And uh, these balloons float along anywhere from 30,000 to 45,000 feet in altitude. So um, it's, it's up there. And generally what comes up as soon as I mention that altitude is, guess what? What about airplanes? <laughs> and I'm gonna bring this up right in front of the presentation so that we can just get this out of the way. Um, the FAA has rules about untethered unmanned balloons. And basically the simp we can read this and there's other pages of it, but the simple uh, answer is, any balloon under four pounds, or excuse me, not the balloon, any payload under four pounds, and we don't have to even notify the FAA, they don't wanna know about it, nothing. That's just uh, something that a commercial airliner would ingest in one of its engines and spit it out the other end. 
So there isn't even a need to notify the FAA. Okay, we got that behind us. <laughs> this, this, believe it or not, I've done some stuff that like, uh, uh, like at Edwards Air Force Base where we have the flight test stuff and people get really worked up over this. So just want to get it out of the way. The balloon itself, generally there's two types used. Um, they're mainly made out of a form of mylar. They're multi-layer, the material. Uh, there's the Chinese party balloons that are 36 inches in diameter. Those are the kind you can buy on Alibaba or eBay or anything for about a buck a piece. Uh, and you kind of get the same kind of quality, but you know, you get your $1 worth. Uh, but some people have been very successful flying those and we've flown a few of our flights with those and they've gone pretty far. So they're not bad, it's just, that's what they are. On the other end of the scale, there's a SBS 13, which is a commercial balloon. And it's a little bit bigger. It's 36 inches in diameter, but it's about five feet long. It allows you to fly a little higher. Um, it's built with probably a little better quality control and it carries a considerable price tag along with it. So that's kind of what the balloons are. Just basically two types of party balloons. One's a little bit bigger than the other. Um, the lifting gas that we're using, and when I say we, it's, uh, I have a friend of mine who I see is lurking in here. Um, what we use for lifting gas is hydrogen, and we use it for a couple reasons. Um, it gives a better, more lift than helium. I don't remember the exact percentage. I think it's 16%, but it's somewhere in there. It's a little bit more lift. Uh, that gets you to fly a little higher. And it has less leakage, which sounds funny and surprises most people because helium or hydrogen is actually a smaller atom than helium. But hydrogen's diatomic. That means there's two atoms for the molecule. And that makes the molecule bigger actually than the helium one. So it doesn't leak as much. And uh, that's really important. You know, we want these balloons to stay up for days or weeks. And then in a lot of places, and I'm speaking internationally here, but you know, a lot of places there are laws that limit how uh, pure the uh, helium can be. And that's because there are idiots that will breathe this stuff. You know, you can breathe it and talk funny, but some people breathe it until they pass out. And so, of course, they had to have legislation and put in places that says you can't sell pure helium like at Walmart and things like that. So that's another reason to go ahead and use hydrogen. And then, uh, the free lift. Free lift is how much lift the balloon has uh, after it's lifting the payload. So if you were to take the balloon with a payload under it and add six grams of weight and it would just hover, that would be the amount of free lift it has. And that tells you how fast it's going to ascend, ascend. And it also um, sets what the pressure is when it gets to neutral buoyancy at altitude. Again, you want to have, it's another balancing act. You want to have just enough lift to get the balloon up into the sky, up to the float altitude, uh, fast enough so that it doesn't ice up or get any sort of moisture on it, but not so much free lift in there that when it gets up there, it has a huge pressure in it and it either pops or eventually stretches and breaks something. And um, so I think that covers that. Here's uh, N6JD and myself. We're sealing a couple balloons. These are the uh, Chinese balloons. And there's two of them here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. And we're heat sealing them. And if you look down the chair here, on the red chair on the seat, that's a tracker with two solar panels. So it's a real small item. And then, so let's talk a little bit how this fits into ham radio. So the payload itself, is in the balloon is tracked, you know, using ham radio. And there's a number of different ways to track it. So you can use APRS. Most of you are familiar with that, I would assume. Um, it's generally on two meters, about half a watt. And at that altitude, it covers quite a great distance when you're over populated areas. Doesn't work so well over oceans or deserts or Africa, places like that, Siberia. Um, but when you're over populated areas, you get, you know, reports every two minutes. Uh, and it's really neat for seeing the balloon move, especially if you have a bunch of people watching it, you know, right off the bat when you launch it. 
Uh, we also use Whisper. Whisper is uh, the weak signal propagation reporter. It's a uh, HF, uh, either 20 meters, which is really common, or 30 meters, or both. Uh, only 10 milliwatts. And at 10 milliwatts, and you can do 5,000 miles uh, reception with that. So that's that works really good. It gets you, uh, when you're over these very remote places, you usually get some sort of reports of what the balloon location is. Um, since, well, I'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute. Um, there's other uh, methods people use too. They use QRSS, uh, Internet of Things, the LoRaWAN, LoRaN, basically. Uh, reverse beacon network, and there's a number of other ones. So there are all kinds of different ways people do it. The problem with most of these other methods is there's no infrastructure in place to track the balloons, where there's APRS all over the world and Whisper is picked up all over the world. So those two ended up being by default the primary uh, ways of receiving it. And both of those balloonists are just um, tagging on to already infrastructure that's there, supported by ham radio operators. Okay, so the other piece of the payload besides the, so that's how it's tracked. There's other pieces or other techniques that we're using here. One, they're solar powered. And uh, generally you don't take batteries up. And the re main reasons there's two, and they're probably not in the order you'd think. Uh, number one is batteries don't work good at, you know, minus 10 or minus 20 degrees Celsius. Um, they'll work a couple cycles sometimes and then almost always die. So they're not a long-term solution. And then again, the other issue is the weight. Um, what we do use is we use supercapacitors. And supercapacitors are perfect for any, this kind of data that we're sending, because we send this data out in bursts, especially uh, APRS. That's how we can get you know, half a watt on APRS. The solar panels will collect the energy for you know, a couple minutes, save it up in the supercapacitors, and then you'll have an APRS burst of you know less than a second, and uh, you use all that energy at once. So that's how you can use your 500 milliwatts. And really, that's what the supercapacitors were originally designed for, and we're actually using them for their uh, original purpose. Um, the other thing about these trackers is most of them are frequency agile, and so there's a couple things that go with that. Um, APRS is not the same frequency around the world. So as a balloon travels around the world, it needs to know where it is, and then it needs to adjust the frequency correctly for the part of the world it's in, so that it matches their APRS frequency. Um, there's also some places that have explicitly stated that you cannot transmit from an airborne platform while you're uh, in amateur radio. So that's called uh, geofenced, and there's, uh, inside the tracker, you have programming that says, hey, turn my transmitter off when we're over these areas. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. Everything to do with this hobby has to do with weight. Trying to get the lightest transmitter, the solar panels, the antennas, everything else. Um, and this is just a general little chart here that kind of shows like the first one are three different kinds of trackers and what the weights are. These are all in grams. Um, like solar panels, these, like the first solar panel that I have listed here, Flex, I sit, put next to it, Lightened. It weighs in at almost two grams, but if we take a pair of scissors to it and we trim off some of the bus work, um, that's little little thin metal, uh, we can lighten it up. And every little quarter of a gram helps out. And then on Whisper, we have to put an HF antenna up. So I know some of you, one or two of you probably have 20 meter antennas up. A uh, 20 meter dipole is a pretty good size uh, piece of wire, 33 feet long. And to try to get one of those on a balloon, that's, that's a chore. But by using really super thin uh, spring steel wire, if you look over here on the right hand side, uh, it weighs eight tenths of a gram for each leg of the dipole. So about one, little over one and a half grams, you have a full length, 20 meter dipole. Believe it or not, this is a bigger wire than we started out with. We started out trying to use some 0.003 stainless steel wire. And uh, besides the fact that stainless steel became, was next to impossible to solder, it was so thin you couldn't see it. You literally could not see the wire. 
and it was so sharp that it went right through my finger and I didn't even know I had it in there. So <laughs> it's uh, five thousandths of an inch is a good compromise between weight and being able to function and get it deployed and everything. And then if you're using Whisper, you have to have a VHF antenna. So, uh, excuse me, if you're using APRS, you have to have a VHF antenna. So some guitar string actually works perfect for that. Eight thousandths is nice and stiff. It holds a real good 19 and a half inch length and uh, that works great for that. Let's see, let's talk about some flights. So that's kind of just a broad overview of this stuff. And like I said, I'm not an expert on any one of these areas. I just trying to give you a, a broad area and then we could go into discussions on any one of these things for a long time. We'll talk about a few flights we've done. Um, our first flight we launched, it was an APRS tracker only. We launched it from here in California and went across the US and then it shot up the East Coast at about 160 knots. And it was during the day when everyone was watching it, had a huge audience watching it. It was really exciting. It's like most of the things if you've ever done the very first time you do it, it's incredibly exciting. And this one was moving really fast in the middle of the day when we had a lot of power to track it and they had a, you know, a big audience. So it was a lot of fun. And it went out over Canada and it, there was a huge storm over England and uh, it went down there. Uh, balloon number two, I had a launch mishap and uh, it was a mistake on my part and the balloon got tangled up on the ground and then I decided to relaunch it because you know you get launch fever. Um, anyone that studied like the NASA stuff and you can know some of the disasters they had was because of launch fever. Uh, that's that's where you're, you're there, you're ready to go and no matter what you're going to get this thing launched. Well it probably had a hole in the balloon because uh, it never made altitude and that was doing both APRS and Whisper. Um, our third balloon we launched was another APRS balloon and it went across the US, it was really neat, and it headed out into the Atlantic and it was missing for a few days. And then it showed up over Madagascar. And uh, then uh, it made its way across uh, the northern part of A Africa and went over Israel and then came down, headed towards the Iran-Pakistan border. And the last uh, place that picked it up was uh, UAE, United Arab Emirates. And uh, it was pretty interesting because I looked up uh, their station that picked it up and they had uh, oh, <laughs> an incredible ham radio station there for their club. So our fourth balloon, uh, we launched it, it went up, it probably had a hole in the balloon, it made it to altitude and it slowly started coming down over the Nevada, Utah desert and it didn't wake up the second day. And the reason I, this one's notable is this is the normal thing that happens for these balloons is if you make it to altitude, they usually don't show up the second day. And just making it to altitude is a huge accomplishment. So we, we've been pretty lucky and we've been really prepared in some of the stuff we've done. But number four here, that's, that's really the most common type of launch for these balloons. And then uh, the fifth flight, the fifth flight is still up as we speak, I hope. <laughs> it's a whisper, so it's transmitting on 20 meters. It's still circumnavigating, and I'll talk a little bit about this flight in a minute. Uh, after it was launched, we launched another one. It made it seven days. It was an APRS. Again, it went across the uh, US, showed up all along the way. It was doing APRS, so every two minutes we were getting reports during the daylight. And um, it, went, uh, it went dark out someplace over the North Atlantic. Oops, go the right way here. So here's launching a Pico balloon. This is the one that's actually flying right now, still up. This is a SBS 13 balloon. So it's you know, about two of the Chinese balloons, uh, but it's all in one envelope. And there's thin wire there. You can barely see it. This is almost on a windless day, uh, but even on a windless day, the, these are so fragile, it's hard to get them off the ground. The, one that's flying right now is called N6CBO-13. You can find that on APRS. And it weighs the whole flight package. The one that I showed you about in the first thing weighs 0.42 of an ounce. 
So if you took two quarters, that's the same weight as the tracker, the computer and voltage regulators on there, the GPS, GPS antennas, the whisper HF transmitter, two solar panels, two supercapacitors, a full length 20 meter dipole, all the rigging, swivels, line, and a weight at the end of the dipole. All of that stuff weighs the same as two quarters. Um, it's, it's a real challenge to get it there and uh, that's kind of part of the uh, fun. So here's a little tracker. I just happened to have one on my desk. I looked over and saw it. I'll show you right now. So here's one right here to give you an idea of the size of it. It's sitting here in my... After you share your screen. Oh, yeah. I'll have to do that afterwards, won't I? <laughs> Sorry about that. I see myself over here. Okay, so that's, again, I just wanted to emphasize that 12 grams weighs almost nothing. And that's the entire package of everything except for the balloon, it, the physical balloon itself. Um, this is the model of a tracker that's currently flying. That's not mine, but it gives you an idea of what it looks like. Um, the one I'm flying is this one here. This is actually mine. If you look to the left of center, you see a little purple wire. Um, that's a, a quarter wave vertical for a GPS. So it's pretty simple at those frequencies. It's just a little short stub of wire. Um, they work really good. That's a GPS antenna. The yellow is just a sleeve that the um, HF antenna, the dipole is ran through to get it you know, off the board. And you can kind of see the solar panels there. And that whole tracker is just a little teeny guy. So telemetry. The whole idea behind this is to get some telemetry down. Telemetry, basically lat longitude and altitude are the, the core of the telemetry we want. Um, Whisper is an interesting protocol that's already out there. It's set up to send out a call sign a four character grid square, the transmitter power, and forward error correction. And it does this all in 50 bits. That's 50 ones and zeros. And it crams all that information together. So it's all compressed. Um, there's no room really to change anything to put altitude in. In fact, you don't even get Latin longitude. You get the four character grid square. So that's a, a box that you're getting where the tracker is. So what uh, we've done is we've encoded the altitude into the power field a whisper and when you get a whisper signal back you'll see the power and that will need to be decoded out to determine what the altitude of the balloon is and that's just one way of doing it there's all kinds of different ways of doing this and lots of people experimenting different ways and if you guys happen to see those black boxes pop up I'm sorry about that I'll explain what it is when I get to the next screen um, so we, we we encode the altitude and whisper into there and then all that gets crammed into 50 bits that gets sent out in a, a two minute packet over whisper at only 10 milliwatts. And then it gets picked up, you know, from, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 miles away. Uh, once a receiver on the ground, someone that's just monitoring whisper uh, for other reasons, they pick up the signal, decode it, it gets written up to um, a database. And then uh, we, I, run a, I run a Python script that reads WhisperNet database, decodes the altitude, and then uploads it to APRS.fi. And then that gets used by various programs. Now let me show you this graphic of the same thing I just said. It's, hopefully it'll be a little clearer. So we have the balloon here in the middle at the top. It's transmitting a whisper packet. It gets picked up by hundreds or thousands of people that are monitoring whisper around the world into their HF radio. And then it gets uploaded to a database on the internet. That's WhisperNet. So that's really the, the key of what happens most of the time. Then every time, every few minutes, my computer here goes out and queries WhisperNet. And if it gets a new packet, it takes it and decodes it and decodes the altitude based on the power field and then uploads it to APRS.fi. That's another database for APRS. It's the one that like, if you go and you want to see what people are driving around or what they're doing, you can see them on there. And then APRS.fi gets queried by you know, a user like me, uh, HabHub, which is a, a British group um, that's high altitude ballooning, ARHab, which is amateur radio, high altitude ballooning, or the LU7AA, which is the um, 
radio telescope in uh, Arecibo. Uh, they're really interested in this ballooning and some of their guys down there have been doing a lot of database work. So uh, all kinds of, that's kind of the way the, the data flows. So a whisper uh, data gets sent down and here's what a um, whisper spot looks like on the database side. Uh, first, you have the timestamp of when it came down, the call sign of the transmitter, the frequency it was transmitting on. Now, I'm gonna stop right here for a moment. If you look at the frequency, it's all different all the way down. It's not on one frequency and there's actually 20 and 30 meter spots on here. When I said before that the frequency or these transmitters are frequency agile, well, some of them are actually capable of transmitting on different frequencies within the whisper subband. So you have a 20 meter band, the whisper subband is only 200 Hertz wide, but you only need uh, less than two Hertz to uh, transmit the whisper down on. So what the transmitter does is it randomly picks different frequencies within that 200 Hertz subband. And that allows you to move around in case there's some big gun station camped on a frequency and wiping you out. You have more likelihood of getting through. And there's some other information after that, the signal to noise, uh, drift, the grid that the transmitter was, is. so this is the balloon. So in this case, the balloon was in DO03. And later on down here, you can see it was in CO92. The power field here, is the one that we've encoded. So uh, two zero actually equates to about 43,000 feet. And then uh, who reported it? W60AS happens to be just, happens to be one of our local hams out here and what their grid was and then how far away they were. So you can see down this list, you look, there's like 2,500 uh, kilometers away and then it gives the azimuth from, from the, um, receiving station back towards the balloon. So that's a database entry. There's also a, a GUI or a graphical interface with the same data. So if you look right in the center of where all the lines cross, that's where the balloon's location was when I took this snapshot. Uh, out at the end of the lines, you can see there's a, a receiving station in Alaska, one in Oregon, Los Angeles, there's one in Nevada, one over in Chicago, and, and a couple up in Canada. So that's how far they're hearing the 10 milliwatt signal. Uh, having it up at 43,000 feet helps, but Whisper is also just really good at doing that. As I said, once you take the Whisper signal in, I run a script that decodes the altitude and then loads it up to APRS database. And then with APRS, when you look there, it makes a nice little track between the points. So you can see that you know on this day or these few days here, it had uh, crossed the Pacific, and we actually got spots while it's out in the middle of nowhere. And then the APR spot, if you actually click on the balloon, you can get you know more data. You'll see uh, like this one is it's at forty three thousand seven hundred ninety seven feet. Uh, that's kind of rounded off a bit because of the data compression to get that encoded into the uh, power field. But it also tells you the frequency that it was transmitting on. This is uh, 20 meters here and gives you some other information. So the current flight, N6 CBO 13, as of today, it's been up for 113 days. Um, that's incredible even to me. I'm totally amazed. It's made it around the globe six and a half times, uh, all in the Northern Hemisphere so far. Uh, it's been flying right around 43,000 feet. And as of a little while ago, it had received or 14,503 whisper spots had been logged by people around the world. So that's how many people had heard it, well, it got 100% decode and then uh, uploaded it to the internet. The first spot was about 5,000 miles away. It was down in Antarctica at the, uh, on the Ross ice shelf down there. And it's gone a little over 120,000 miles. So in the past seven days, you can pick it up over here on the left, uh, Northern Africa there, Libya. And then it came across the end of the Med and Beirut, crossed over, you know, across Tibet, China, and then over Japan. 
and then headed out in the Pacific. And it was in the jet stream this whole time. It was headed to go around the world again really fast because it was in a fast moving jet stream. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's just part of the whole game. There was a huge um, cyclone down near Taiwan. And you can see it affected the high altitude winds enough that the balloon made a turn and started back towards Taiwan. And then it got kicked out. So it's kind of floating around right now out in the middle of, it's out really near Guam. And uh, the, so I can go right here. There's the balloon as of the last spots that were received. And Guam's to the left and you got Micronesia down below it and the Marshall Islands off a little bit to the right. Uh, it's a little harder when you're out in the ocean because there's not a lot of landmarks, but uh, that's kind of where the last position was. So oh, let me back up one slide here. So where I think it is right now, this moment, because this was two days ago and I haven't got a spot in two days, I'm pretty sure it's down here in the Marshall Islands. Uh, last night it was probably over Bikini Atoll up here and today it's probably over Majuro in the Marshall Islands. How would I know that? Well, we use flight path prediction software and believe it or not, NOAA has a supercomputer that's available for the public to use. And you can go in there and it was originally designed to track stuff like um, nuclear fallout or volcanic ash or you know a Chernobyl type uh, you know problem something like that and track where the the particles would go and they've converted and there's actually a balloon piece of it that actually tracks balloons for us and it's available to the public you can go and use it there's a few limitations um, but it's pretty incredible if you put good data in you get incredibly accurate tracks out two three days uh, any further than that it's it's really a guess the only thing is you need to be really precise about what you put in. Otherwise, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. You just, uh, you get junk if you put junk in it. But um, it's it's really neat. Anyone can use it. If you're interested in any of that, you can just do a Google search for NOAA high split and it takes you right there. So that gets you really detailed predictions of, you know, where the balloon might be going. The other thing you can look at is any sort of flight level 450 winds. And there's a couple programs out there you can do. And that gets you a bigger picture. You can look at the whole ocean or whole hemisphere or something like that, get an idea of which way the winds are going and how the balloon's going to go. And again, that's for seeing the big picture. Oh, and also seeing storms. Uh, at 43,000 feet, we're above most of the storms. And that's one of the key things with these balloons. 30,000 feet is right at the top of the weather most of the time. There are some summer storms that go higher, but that puts you right at the top of the weather. So any higher than that you can get, uh, you get more and more out of the weather. The slightest bit of icing on these balloons will bring them down. So if you get in a cloud that gets any moisture on it uh, at you know 10 or 20 degrees uh, below zero centigrade, it's gonna freeze up and it'll add a little bit of weight to the balloon and it'll bring it down. So here's a high split model of uh, the current balloon that's currently in flight. Unfortunately, it's over the ocean, so I didn't know whether to leave an example or actually show one over the ocean, so I thought I'd just show you the real deal. Um, you, the star up here is uh, when I entered it in, and it shows it's going over, and where is it going? Well, the last dot on the right-hand side near the bottom there, that's over the Marshall Islands, so that's where I think it is today, and that's based on this. Where it's gonna go starting tomorrow, is you can kind of pick up the dot here on the left and continue going to the right. And you see in three days time, it'll be between the Hawaiian Islands. You can see the big island of Hawaii up there on the right hand, upper right hand corner. And then Kiribati is down below the line down there. It's a little dot down there. So that's kind of where the predictions are it's going. So hopefully we'll hear from it again in a few days. Um, kind of surprised I haven't heard from it today on uh, one hand, but on the other hand, this is one of the most true parts of the world. Um, we've done a lot of in this area. Why? It's because of its remoteness. So there's a, 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 good, a good chance that it's just uh, so far away from stuff that uh, it should show up. So we'll have our fingers crossed. 
And then uh, we had a couple really interesting overflights. Um, I, I was in aerospace during the height of the Cold War. So over, having the balloon overfly Moscow was kind of a neat thing for me. It's kind of a personal interest. It was really interesting. Uh, it did a flight over the North Pole and went up on the uh, east coast of Canada, went up over the North Pole and came back down the Bering Strait, basically. Uh, it didn't get any precise tracking data when it went over the North Pole, but all of the predictions said that it went within about 200 miles of the North Pole and it showed up on the other side of the world uh, in the right place at the right time. So have a high level of confidence that it did come really close to the pole. Um, another thing that happened a few weeks ago, which was really interesting, it flew right up through Ukraine towards Belarus. And it suddenly, it was the middle of the day, it was sending out hundreds of spots. It was really tracking really well. And all of a sudden it stopped transmitting. So I zoomed in on the area and it was directly over Chernobyl. Well, I thought, well, that's kind of strange. And then it didn't transmit anymore. So I kind of had some concern that maybe the electronics had got damaged and we'd never hear from it again. But it turned out that wasn't the case. It showed up a, a day later and it started transmitting again just fine. Well, what I did is I started doing some research and I, I emailed a, another ham over in Russia and I asked if he knew anything and he sent me in, in a direction. And it turns out that the uh, government over there is blocking the GPS signals in the Chernobyl area. And so when the balloon's GPS signal got blocked, it didn't transmit because it didn't know what its location was. So my first thought was, oh, okay, they must be doing that for you know security or secrets or something like that. It turns out that's not why they're blocking the GPS at all. There's um, these gamers online and there's a game that these guys play and it's it's set in Chernobyl. It's what this online game is. But a lot of people have started taking it and actually going to Chernobyl with their GPSs and they're actually playing this game for live, for real, by sneaking into the area, crossing rivers, taking pictures of themselves in contaminated areas, and the government over there is trying to prevent it. So they've been blocking the UPS signals in those areas. Um, or the GPS signals in those areas to keep these gamers from going playing a real game on the ground there. Uh, just absolutely incredible. And not something I ever thought, but it's one of those things you find out when you're flying the balloon and uh, neat stuff happens. And then the other really interesting thing to me personally is that it overflew Bikini Atoll. And that's just because I've, I've done a lot of diving down there and on all the ships that have been sunken with the, uh, with the atomic bombs when we were testing them after World War II and over the entire Marshall Islands. So just that's just interesting to me personal. Okay, so resources. There's a whole bunch of resources if uh, anyone's interested. APRS.FI is the easiest and the best way to find and look at uh, balloons that are in flight. Like I said, whispernet.org shows the uh, raw whispernet, whisper data coming down. If you want to find out about Pico ballooning, the best thing is there's a, a groups.io group and it's called Pico Balloon. Like, big surprise there. And there's some really super smart people on there, way more smarter than I am. Uh, there's people that have taken little slices of the ham radio uh, hobby and divided it up. There's some people that are using various ham radio stuff to test balloons and the strength of the envelopes. Other people measuring pressures and trying to get telemetry down. Some of us just flying around and having a good time. Uh, but like all other ham radio stuff, they've divided into little pieces and uh, there's just tons of stuff there. Uh, QRP Labs, uh, they make some great products. They also have a, they have a couple trackers that I've been using. Um, they also have a user group of a lot of great people on there. Uh, ARHAB, Amateur Radio High Altitude Ballooning. They've got some good information. Zactech is another company that makes uh, that one tracker that I'm currently flying. Like I said, you can Google NOAA High Split and that'll get you predictions software. And it's pretty interesting to go and play with for all kinds of reasons besides just um, balloons. And then there's a website called windy.com, which is pretty neat. And it shows the winds around the entire globe and you can change the levels and you can look at clouds. There's all kinds of good stuff. And like always, there's always Google Earth for finding locations on what's going on. 
So with that said, I wanted to just thank uh, my friend that's been helping me with all this in 6 jd which I see is on here lurking, so is his wife. Um, and then I want to thank everyone that's either emailed or sent questions or participated in this. Uh, all the encouragement and stuff has just been incredible. And uh, that's really part of what keeps me going to this. And uh, there's uh, one of our launches right there. Everyone watching and go off. So that's pretty much all, all I have for the slideshow. Um, if I can figure out how to stop sharing here. Okay, am I back? Yeah, you see me? I see Oscar. Okay. So let me just show you what I just found one tracker I had laying on my desk here. So this is a tracker right here. It looks bigger than I thought it would be. <laughs> So that's about that big. So, okay, uh, I'm totally uh, open for questions, so go ahead. I don't see your hands up, so let's take them from the chat. Go ahead, uh, Barry. Someone wants to know when flight number five was launched. Oh, I don't have the, I don't, oh, when it was launched? Yeah. Uh, you mean the one that's up now? It was launched on July 12th. Okay. What is the average speed? I don't know whether that's a knot to miles per hour, but. I don't know for the whole flight. I know on the APRS ones, it varies wildly. Uh, we had it as slow as 30 knots and we've had it as high as 165 knots. Uh, generally, I would, you know, I did some, a few weeks ago, I did a calculation and it was running around 100 knots as an average. Okay. One other thing, just a, as a side note, it's hard for people to comprehend that the balloon is still moving at night when the sol when it's not transmitting data. You know, it's moving all the time. Uh, that just seems to be a, a thing that people have a hard time comprehending. So, uh, next question. The wind in the jet stream. Exactly, it just keeps moving. Whether it's transmitting or not, it doesn't transmit on the balloon's night, but it's still moving. Yeah, I have a question. This is Carol, KP4MD. Go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I have a, a, a whisper receiver on uh, constantly, 24 hours a day. Actually, I'm res running Whisper Demon. Uh, I monitor all the HF bands, mm -hmm. and uh, I have not spotted your um, your bell balloon, but I'm looking now on WhisperNet, and it says that you're sending Whisper Two. Is that the mode you're using now? Yes, I think so. Uh, I would have to go back and double check that. I'm trying to think what the differences were. Well, th that would kind of limit the, uh, your uh, people who are receiving you because not everybody's using that mode. Oh no, no, I'm not not the uh, not the four minute mode. I'm only using the, the two minute mode. The the single transmission on Whisper. If that's what you're asking. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's just I don't see that coming up on any. Uh, I'm I'm WhisperNet right now, looking at the database and. Um, what time of time period? It hasn't, the balloon has been out of touch for like three days. So if you do a week on there, you should see it show up. Okay, I'll take a look. Thank you. Okay. No, you're welcome. And if you still have problems, email me. Mm -hmm. Okay, one yeah. more chat and then we can go to Oscar. What is the graphic GUI you use to track the balloon? Can you superimpose it on Google Maps or other mapping programs? And in addition to the X and Y, can you get the Z on the map too? Oh boy. Um, yes, uh, on APRS.fi, the database, you can download the tracks and you can download them as a KMZ file, I think it is. And then you just take that file and when you open Google Earth, you can import that file and it'll lay tracks down. And you can actually lay tracks down for multiple, you know, uh, circumnavigations of the Earth. You can lay them on top of each other until it turns in a big tangled mess, or you can just look at an individual one. So it just depends on the, whatever uh, chunk of data you, you download from APRS.fi. And uh, that does have uh, altitude in it also, the Z axis. Okay. That's all the questions in the chat and Oscar has his hand up. Go ahead, Oscar. I don't hear him. He's muted. Unmute yourself, Oscar. 
I it's really been beautiful. The work that you have been doing is really beautiful. I have done some ballooning, and and but it's all typically for four to six hours. And you know, we fly from Puerto Rico and have to come back to the island, so <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's going to be difficult to get it at sea. But uh, but definitely, uh, you're. I have several questions. Uh, one of them, you have super uh, super capacity batteries, and they how much they last. I mean, you have to you charge during the day, and then you if they're are you transmitting during the night, and how much the battery lasts during the night? That will be my first question. Okay, so I probably missed out on that when I started talking. The transmitter only transmits during the daylight, and the super capacitors are only saving a charge up between transmissions. So the panels are just big enough to charge them up until the next burst of data. Yeah. So that, that, that comes to the second question. How many times you transmit per minute or so? Because I saw several, uh, when, you, when you display the, uh, the, the database or uh, transmitting there, several stations copying at the same time or you're transmitting several times. Uh, what is the time lap? I mean, that you use yeah, well, that's that depends on the mode. So APRS, uh, it transmits usually every two minutes for an APRS transmitter. The balloon that's up now doesn't have APRS. It's just using Whisper. And Whisper is only transmitting when it changes grid squares. So when it changes grid squares, then it's transmitting. So, oh, excuse me, that's, that's not correct. Uh, yes, I'm getting my trackers mixed up. So <laughs> the tracker that's up now flying it transmits uh, every, it transmits for two minutes on 20 meters. It transmits for two minutes on 30 meters. And then it rests for two minutes and charges back up and also queries the GPS and gets an updated uh, position and fix. And then make sure it has a full charge in the supercapacitors for the next transmissions. So it's a six Perfect. minute cycle. All right, so the, thank you. Really impressive. Thank you. Okay. Like I said, I'm not a super expert on this. So I'm just, you know, learning as we go. You got one, more in the, one more in the chat, Dan. Okay. Is there any coordination required with the FAA during launch? And I, he assumes you need to be clear of controlled airspace, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's pretty much self-explanatory. Sure, you don't want to launch you know, under an airport, you want to make sure you're up at altitude before you start crossing over anything like that. So you do need to take that in consideration. Uh, most of it's common sense. Uh, again, if it's under four pounds, and we're about 100 times under four pounds, uh, then there is no coordination necessary. Okay. Okay. And someone wants to know who does the board soldering. <laughs> well, it depends. Uh, I showed the trackers, uh, tracker I showed you and the other one that I had in my hand here, those are commercial products that uh, come already pre-made. Uh, there are lots of people making their own boards and soldering either the SMDs or other kind of components. Pretty much you need to use surface mount devices though to get the weight down. So they, I've soldered a few, mixed luck, sometimes they work. It's, it's a challenge. Okay, that's everything in the chat. Okay, Okay. well, I want to th thank you guys for listening to me. Hopefully I shared a little bit of knowledge and piqued some interest. Like I said, there's areas that, uh, you know, we could talk about forever, but uh, I tried to just do a brief overview of everything. Okay. And uh, so thank you. Well, so Brian, wants, this, this is great. I want to know what the cost of the boards are since they're commercial. The boards generally run right around a hundred bucks on the commercial ones. Uh, you can do it yourself for, I don't know, anywhere from 30 to 50 bucks, depending on how much you scrounge. Um, there are boards that go up into the $300 range. Price does not relate to their functionality. There's no correlation between the two. Okay. And someone wants to know what call sign should I look for when they're tracking? The one that's up now is N6CVO-13. If you're on, if you go to Whisper though, there's no, that's on APRS. If you go to Whisper and look, it's just going to be in six CVO. Make sure that's an O at the end, not a zero. Okay. All right. Well, Thank you. Great.
Well, Brian, I appreciate you coming on and sharing this. This is, this is to me, what amateur radio is all about. It's, it's a very broad hobby with so many different aspects to things going on. It's mind-boggling, uh, all this different stuff out there. It was, you did a very good job with that presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else, uh, comments or suggestions or questions or whatever? Lots of comments about it being way cool and an excellent presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, it was a very good. Hope to have you on again. You got some, you got some good stuff you to share. <laughs> okay. Well, anytime. All righty. All right. Well, unless there's something else, I will cut this short and say 73s, everybody. But I don't want to leave anybody out. So uh, again, is there any more questions out there? Nope. Oscar, how are we doing on time? <laughs> You're perfect. Let's go. <laughs> okay. All right. 73s, everyone. Appreciate it. I will have another tomorrow. Same time, same place. And it's going to be more Aries uh, oriented. So 73s and see you when I get to see you. Good night, all. 73 small. 73s and thanks, Dan. Thank you.